Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today is an animator in the video game industry and is most notable for his tenure at Retro Studios, where he worked on Metroid Prime 2 and 3, as well as Donkey Kong Country Returns and Tropical Freeze. However, he has done a lot more than that. But I'd like to welcome Carlos Mendieta. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for taking time out. If you ever get time out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't it seems like uh video game industry people don't get much time, free time that is. It's just always go, go, go. It yeah, it can be. I I like to keep myself busy just because I like I said, I do uh I'll do comics and art on the side. Mm. Uh so if you're not doing uh the day gig uh in video games and stuff, then uh I'm doing other stuff on the side. Right. But uh what's you which do you prefer, animating or drawing? Uh, they're both, I mean, they're both labor intensive, but they're they're both different in their own ways. Um, they both, they actually both complement each other as far as like video game stuff goes, because with comic books, I get to do, I'm in complete control of everything. So I can just publish and do whatever I want. Hmm. And then uh, video games is such a collaborative uh, endeavor. Um you can't really go in there thinking you're going to get all your ideas in or, or that you're going to, you know, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to get your way all the time. You have to pick and choose your battles and, and, uh, but they're both rewarding in different ways. Like being, you know, collaborative, working with a team and working on something together, has, you know, it's rewarding in its own ways. But if you do have that uh, itch to scratch where you want to do things like, you know, your own way, um, the, it kind of inspires each other. Right. Because then you sit alone drawing comics all the time, uh, then you get lonely, and then uh, <laughs> but then you get to go back and work with a team on something kind of like that's you know much bigger, obviously. Mm. Uh, so kind of one one kind of feeds the other as far as like creative energy. So one thing I've always wondered is because you work with a number of different animators, right? You all have your specific styles and all different things that you're good at, but it has to look like the same person animated the whole game. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you work in conjunction with the other animators to get this cohesive package? I mean, in my experience, usually, um, you know, like the lead or uh, the art, the animation director or, you know, the game designers or whatever, or they'll establish a, a style. Well, this is, you know, it's cartoony or it's more realistic, but stylized or it has to be super realistic. And they dictate what the kind of tone and the, the, the style of the, the animation for the game is. And then, you know, you usually like we test it out and, and, and try to uh, we'll do some R&D for it. And then basically it's just going in there and uh, working with game designers, knowing what's needed for the animations. And then you do uh, it, you iterate a lot. You iterate a lot. You get feedback from other animators. You have dailies. Uh, depending on the studio, sometimes it's once a week, sometimes it's daily. Uh, but yeah, everyone everyone kind of um, gives each other feedback uh, so that it all ends up kind of looking um, so there's no like obvious uh, distinctions between, oh, this guy animated that or that guy animated that. Then it's just, oh, that's just Donkey Kong. Yeah, yeah. So specifically with Prime 2 and 3, what was the stuff that you animated? Uh, we did on, on that game, I think there was only four animators, uh, or no, five. There was five of us at, at Tops, and yeah, we all of us touched uh, everything. I mean, we did uh, boss battles, we did, uh, you know, gameplay, space pirates, uh, you know, creatures, uh, the cinematics at the end, the cutscenes. Uh, we would we touched everything. Do you remember something specifically that stands out to you in terms of difficulty? On uh, let me see, Metroid Prime Two. Uh, I mean, it's always. I mean, games are always like pretty challenging. Each game brings its own, you know, difficulties and things to it. Uh, on Metroid, uh, animation-wise, I don't remember. We had a. I mean, we had during that game. We were such a tight knit group of animators, and we were all like. Uh, uh, my friend, the senior animator, uh, Steven Zafros, he's the one that brought me in uh, into the into retro. Uh, and then we were all worked pretty tightly with one another and we all gave each other kind of like feedback. Um, and then the way we made the games back then, it was 
we would get assigned a, a game designer, um, a um, an engineer. We'd have our lead, and uh, maybe another animator if he was working on a character. And they'd give us like six to eight weeks, and we would, you know, have a couple meetings a week. I think it was, and we would, you know, block things in so we can get them into the engine quick for the engineers to start working on them. And then uh, we would iterate and each of those meetings we would sit in there. So it'd be uh, the president, uh, the producer, Brian Walker, who you've spoken to before. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the designer, the engineer and the animator. And we'd just all collectively play the game, you know, play that character that we were working on. And we would, you know, slowly but surely like massage it down to the, you know, till it was all working and looking good or whatever. And then we'd move on to, you know, another six or eight week chunk and move on to the next character. So I remember from, from what I remember, um, Metroid Prime 2 was a nice like steady march all the way down to the end. And at the end, all, all the animators had to do were just all the, uh, all the cut scenes. Because in the middle, if they had to move rooms or move things around, you didn't want to do all the cut scenes because then that would change the cut scenes and stuff. So yeah, it was a nice steady march. We had the whole game uh, pretty much done to the end. And then our, our crunch was basically just hammering out the, uh, the cut scene. So I actually remember it as pretty, uh, pretty fun with not a lot of at least animation hardships as far <laughs> as I remember. <laughs> Cause what is the greatest challenge with that? Cause obviously you're working in conjunction with the camera system as well. Like I think mm -hmm. of the, the morph ball obviously is one of the most complex things I think in the game. And I know when she, she comes out of the ball, there's a small animation did mm -hmm. you touch that at all because it's so I, fluid and how it's done yeah i don't think i didn't me i think uh two of the seniors one, one of the other two dax or Derek, i think messed with that uh i never i never messed with that uh, i think the first thing I, I got hired right when they were starting to ramp up and start on metroid 2 so the first thing i i think i worked on and ev everybody worked on was the space pirates because right. that was just the, that was like the default enemy in the game, right? So that was the first thing we tackled. So all of us just you know basically got the list from uh, design and just split it up, hmm. you know. And uh, you do this, you do this chunk, you do this chunk, you do this chunk, and then the same thing, you know, you iterate it until it's it's all nice and polished. Did you play the first game before you started tackling the space pirates just to get a oh. feel, or were you like, no, oh, I'm yeah. just going to go in blind? <laughs> No, no. I mean, Metroid, I mean, I'm for, super, super fortunate enough that I, I was able to work on probably my favorite game ever. Like Metroid, I remember playing it on the original NES. Uh, nice. And it was just, a, it was a game changer back then. So yeah, I was, I was well aware. Uh, I was up in Chicago when the first one came out and uh, yeah, me and all my friends were playing it when it came out and it was just mind bendingly good. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, when you're animating a cutscene, is there a specific point that takes the most time like if you're keyframing a specific movement like say if dark samus moves her hand or something because i know hands are quite hard to draw and animate well that's what i understand yeah drawing for sure yeah i mean uh the way that we did the the cutscenes, I, I guess to answer your question it, it depends on um how complex the the cut scenes. we had lots of cut scenes where it was uh you know where you go get where you you attain the gravity boots for instance mm. and that's just the solo room the gravity boots are in samus walks in gets the thing does a move and and you know boom you know yeah we got the gravity boot right um so those are you know those were kind of not as complex but then there was other ones i remember like a metroid prime 3 where you had all of the you know gandreda and all of those in in a you know, in samus and in dark samus all in the same cinematic and stuff so when you're juggling all those characters that's uh that that's complicated and uh so i remember there was actually one or the more than one uh that was actually so big and there was so much going on it actually got split between three different animators i think for metroid prime 3 that had all of those like bounty hunters in it <laughs> yeah well uh, uh prime yeah. 3 is a bit more cinematic as well so i imagine yeah there's more cut scenes so more work on the animators yeah yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the, yeah, the cutscenes, how we did them on Metroid Prime 2 was, uh, again, it was uh, like four of us, five of us. And um, we would just get a list. These are all the cutscenes that we're at. And then we would split them up. And then we would have each animator would have two weeks per cutscene. So we would do the first week of all the animation for it. 
And then the second week we would do uh, all the scripting for it to get it into, into game and working and playing right. And then once you're done with that, we would move on to the next thing. Same thing, a week of animation, a week of scripting. Right. So would you handle one cutscene yourself and another team member would handle another cutscene, or would yep. both of you be working on the same cutscene? For Metroid 2, it was pretty much we all had our own. And then like you, like you mentioned, uh, the three had more cutscenes and it was more cinematic and uh, there was a lot more going on. Uh, so those there were cases where sometimes we would split one, you know, into three and even our our third chunk <laughs> was still a lot, was still a lot going on. Um, <laughs> But uh, but yeah, yeah. Just I mean, yeah. Just a comp- depends on the complexity and how many characters, or or for instance, what what the animation or move uh, that they're looking for would depend on how kind of difficult it would be or not. Right. So, w- in regards to the cutscenes, did you get much of a say in terms of the pitch of what they do? So you mentioned with the gravity boots, she does like a flip. Uh-huh. Would you would you make, pitch an idea during a meeting or? someone else would suggest it and then you might uh bounce off that or elaborate on it or you'd all bounce off each other in terms of the 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 cut scene or would you just be given a scene and be like do it like this we would more more as far as i remember i i think there were instances where we did where we're able to because of of time or, or whatever like we would storyboard a couple of them ourselves, uh, but m- more often than not, we would get storyboards from uh, from SPD, and they would, you know, they would be, have a description storyboard, and these are the exact shots, and this is exactly how they wanted them to be, and you know, we might be able to toy with it and 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 you know, play with the timing some because we were scripting it and stuff, and mess with the timing or mess with the you know the angle of the shot or whatever. But basically, most of the time, they they came in storyboards the way that they wanted them. Hmm. Yeah, and so with Prime Three, I suppose it was just everything was bigger, like more gigantic in terms of workload and the amount of scenes and how many people within the scenes and so forth. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember actually uh, after the, I think after the second one, they were going to say that there wasn't going to be as many cut scenes in the third one, and then of course <laughs> ended up being way more. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, we also had a concept artist uh, that actually he split the, uh, the the storyboards with SPD, I think, for Metroid Prime 3. So some of them were done in-house and approved, and, and some of them were done uh, in Japan from SPD, and they would deliver them. But, All right. Uh, okay. Are you referring to Android Jones or Andrew Jones? Um, I think he might have done some early on, but then there was another, uh, Sammy Hall was another uh, concept artist that was there for Prime 3 and then I think uh, part of Donkey Kong. Uh, so I think I remember I remember getting uh, storyboards from him. Hmm. How was it moving from Metroid to Donkey Kong? Because that's like an entirely different art style, entirely different in terms of how you animate it. Yeah. Was it, was it easy for you to just switch tact and do that or did it take a while to kind of get into the the different uh way of tackling it it took i mean it took a little bit of an adjustment uh me personally i could probably work on metroid for the rest of my life and be content (laughs) if (laughs) if i had the choice uh but i remember lots of people and, and myself included that it was uh it was a breath of fresh air that we get to now not only, you know, play with Donkey Kong and, and do a game uh, that was completely different than Metroid, but also completely different in style. So I, I remember a lot of the animation team was really excited about being able to do like more cartoony and different different kind of stuff as opposed to the Metroid stuff. And also, you know, Metroid being first person, now we were doing a third person platformer. So we got to do, you know, the player package. We got to work on all four Kongs and... Um, I mean, which was, I mean, it was challenging, but it was also, you know, different and, and fun. So how, you know, if you leave Donkey Kong and don't touch him for a while, he kind of just stands there and he starts doing these little cool little animations. Mm-hmm. Was who Whose idea was that? And did you get any, did you have any involvement in doing those little quirky things? I, 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 I want to say that, yeah, I did fidgets and, and stuff for characters and I might've done some for donkey kong but i remember one specifically that was probably one of my favorite and probably everyone's favorite is uh 
and it might have even been his idea his idea i'm not sure but when donkey kong yeah he's he stands there and then he sits down and he busts out his uh, ds and he starts playing uh dax Pilata, i think did that if i'm not mistaken uh if somebody else yeah if somebody else out there remembers differently uh let me know but i think he was the one that did that that yeah he pulls out his ds because that's the ds was coming out at the same time yeah so that was a that was a really neat touch how much time does it add when you move from standard definition graphics to hd graphics because obviously you worked on donkey kong country returns and then you moved on to tropical freeze and mm-hmm. that was in hd mm-hmm. uh, how much does it actually change in terms of the animation i mean i can imagine in terms of the the actual artwork it would add more because there's more pixels and everything but in terms of animation does it change much or is there just a lot more keyframing the animation didn't really yeah change much i mean we export i mean we exported at 30 frames per second i believe it was still the same mm. and uh and and the way that we went about the you know animating and doing the job it was the same as as donkey kong country i mean obviously you know different game and and different types of things that you're doing different enemies and stuff but yeah it, it didn't really change much animation wise um th- i mean things change when you're going from one to the other that you know you're gonna you're gonna make a new, you know. I think we made new skeletons for DK and then res them up a bit, and and you know that that type of thing. But like specifically animation wise, uh, I didn't think it changed our, our workflow uh, much at all. Hmm. Because didn't you do some animation with the fur? You did more animation with the fur? Oh, on the yeah, on tropical freeze. Yeah. Yeah, there might have been fidgets where he does things with uh, the fur, but I mean that's those are technical artists and and engineers that mess with that. We like the animators uh, didn't really have anything to do with with making the fur work. Right, right. We're still yeah, we would still just export animations and animate them like normally or whatever, and that was uh, yeah, technical artists and engineers that that made that happen. Hmm. So how was it animating some of the bosses over those two two games? They were fun. They they were um, actually for both of them. Uh, we after Metroid Three, um, we had some more animators, and I think there were eight eight bosses in each one. So there were enough animators that each one of us got to pick and choose one uh, one boss battle, and then we were in charge of doing the intro and the outro cutscene and all the animations for for the battle. So you got uh, you got quite a bit of ownership uh working on that so that was that was really cool that was really rewarding actually i did uh i did the owl boss in a tropical freeze oh nice it was a lot of fun to work on just to be able to you know you could say hey i did the owl boss (laughs) donkey kong (laughs) so that's cool (laughs) how much time does it take because obviously you spent two weeks with some of the cut scenes on metro prime 2 but how long did some of the cut scenes or some of in in terms of uh tropical freeze and donkey kong country returns how long oh, those were, take? yeah, those were different. I mean, the the cutscenes in Donkey Kong, excuse me, uh, weren't that. Uh, I mean, there weren't as many. Like you know, you had if you had the boss battle and you had an intro and an outro, then that's that's all you had to do, and they were pretty simple. You know, the characters come in. I mean, you had to do four versions for all the Kongs. Uh, which was one of the things that made them a little more complex. But basically, it's an intro and an outro, and then you spent, at least I spent most of the time in the actual boss battle, like fine-tuning that and iterating with the engineer and the designer. Um, but then Metroid was different just because there were so many more cuts. You just did that. You just did much more cutscenes. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, sp- I mean, with realistic graphics, does that mean that the movement has to be more fluid? Can you get away with stuff when you're doing it more cartoony because it doesn't have to be as realistic? Uh, it's, th- I mean, yeah, realistic there. I mean, the thing about one of the things about real, I mean, they both have to be good and they both take, uh, they both take time. So they both have their, their, you know, their things about them. Uh, but the thing when animating something like super realistic is that you have uh, something to compare it with in real life which is why like something like facial animation and stuff is so difficult just because human beings are used to uh, looking and reading each other's eyes and reading each other's faces and expressions. So any tiny little thing that's going to be off on like facial animation, people like pick it up like that. Cause I mean, we're hardwired to do that. 
Mm. Um, so I would say, yeah, that makes it a bit tougher, but then you also have motion capture and, you know, making realistic animation uh, a bit, I don't want to say easier, but, you know, it, it's definitely a powerful tool. Yeah, I mean, cartoony stuff, I mean, it, it, it's fun. It's snappy. It's 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 not quite as intense as, as realistic animation, but I mean, it's still it still takes work. Um, I mean, I remember the yeah, I mean, I think each one of the Kongs uh, for the player package had like well over uh, 1100 or 1200 animations each one uh, just for that player package, something like that. So, I mean, that's, you know, coming close to like 5000 animations for all four Kongs. And how long does it take to do one animation it depends like like a fidget like you were saying um you know that's a it goes from an idol to an idol so that's basically like for instance the one that he throws the ds it's a standalone just animation it doesn't it, it's not complicated where it has to blend immediately to a bunch of other different animations right like the rocket pack or you know diddy's rocket pack or whatever so, I mean, that, that that's kind of fun animation where you can just sit there and do that. Other animations are like a whole bunch of animations that are broken up into tiny like transitions and stuff for it to be able to go from one uh, state, from one hub state to like, you know, potentially three or four other ones, right? So if Donkey Kong's jumping in the air and then all of a sudden you hit the rocket pack with Diddy, well, he's going to have to be able to seamlessly blend into that. Or maybe he jumps into the air and he hits the vines. Well, he's going to have to be seamlessly transition into that so it gets it gets kind of yeah spider webby and crazy really quick <laughs> so how do you keep track of all the different animations you have to do because wouldn't you just get confused yes like, wait which which one was i <laughs> <laughs> yes uh yeah no i mean uh, having a strong team a strong lead um you know coordinating all that stuff uh working with engineers and designers and knowing you know having a good plan early on and knowing exactly what you want uh, before you really start getting too deep into that. Because obviously, as you can imagine, if you have these systems of animations that are all built that kind of like connect to each other like that, once you're kind of deep into it, if you want to make a major change, that's going to affect poses and, and transitions and, and all kinds of stuff. So, uh, I mean, yeah, the earlier you kind of... Uh, you you have a good idea of what you want with the animation system it's gonna it's gonna make it um it's gonna give you less headaches for sure i mean there's always gonna be headaches but you know because mm. I mean. you probably have to know the limitations of what you can animate or how far you can push it right just so it doesn't affect any frame rate uh yeah i mean we compress we compress the animations and stuff so there's compression with that and uh you know uh, and it also depends on a, a lot of, you know, what else is in the scene. If there's a million effects and a million high poly, you know, that that's going to kill your, your frame range as well, your frame rate as well. Um, so yeah, it just, it just depends on what, what else is in the scene for like frame rate, but animation, uh, yeah, we tend to compress stuff. Uh, obviously animations. I mean, I mean, for something like Donkey Kong and like the, the, uh, player, you know, animations aren't, aren't very long since everything's happening and they have to be responsive to what the player does. It's a lot of choppy, you know, quick animations or loops and stuff that, that all blend into something else. So like animations aren't, um, you know, very long, whether we're, you know, kill frame rate like that. Mm. So when say you're animating some stuff with Samus or Dark Samus or even some of the hunters, would you like do the motion with your hand? You know, just to oh, get yeah. an idea. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The more reference you do, the the better your animation is going to be. So there's all all kinds of tools and stuff to do that. But yeah, you could act it out. You could get up, you know, next to your chair on your desk, and somebody will walk by, and you're doing some. Like <laughs> my uh, my partner the other day, I was I was working on something, and then she came into the room and saw me like doing something like this, and I was kind of going like that, and she was like, "Is your back okay?" <laughs> It's like, no, no, I'm acting out like how like this punch would go or whatever. Uh, so yeah, you'll act it out or you, you know, YouTube is a great reference now that you could look up just about anything. Um, you can film yourself and then uh, there's a really great, um, there's a really great uh, tool called the uh, Keyframe MP, which allows you to load up any video you, you want onto it, any reference video, but it allows you to scroll like, frame by frame 
So that if you want some kind of really detailed or some really good reference or whatever, you'll be able to like pick out like timing and block things out really easily because it allows you to scroll like uh, frame by frame. So that's a really great tool. How long has that been around for? I don't know. I found I've known about that for a few years, four or five years. Right. Six years. I don't know. Yeah. Because when you were working at Retro, you wouldn't have had access to all those types of tools, right? I mean, the, I the internet wasn't at the level it is now and you didn't have youtube so i wasn't aware of that particular to, uh tool uh i left i left retro in uh march of 2016 mm. uh, so i was there for 13 years uh so i wasn't aware of that I, I found that out when i went to uh when i went to an exile uh but that's been a good one but i mean it's basically the same thing you could you know get youtube videos or film yourself or uh, and kind of do the same thing uh, so there's there, i mean there's just an abundance I mean, there's no shortage of reference nowadays. Yeah, yeah. I suppose the cool thing is all the other animators would be doing the same thing you're doing. So it's not like if you're getting up and doing weird poses, people are going to be like, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, no. It's, it's a safe yeah, environment. It's, yeah, no, no. Yeah, people, I mean, yeah, sometimes, I mean, there, there were cases when uh, you'd film me, you know, you'd film each other. Hey, I need you to film me to do this for reference or whatever. And you go to the other person's desk and, and film film them. I mean, that's a common thing as well. Mm. You do like shoots or whatever. Do you remember a specific cutscene where you were using your own body language or someone else's specifically? When I was thinking of myself as the inspiration? Yeah. We were like, yeah, oh, I look so good here. I'll just put Samus over me. I think there was, I, I animated a hit reaction in, in Tropical Freeze where there was the, the walrus enemy that walks. Oh, yes. And then he gets hit in the butt when uh, when Donkey Kong goes into his role. So he gets hit and he falls like on his, on his, uh, on his hands. And I, I wanted to do something, you know, a little bit to give it a little bit more character than just the regular, ah, I got hit. So I had him, uh, I acted it out in my office where, he, he gets hit in the butt. He falls on the floor on like one hand and then he looks behind him real quick and rubs his butt. <laughs> uh, so I use myself for reference on that one. Uh, but yeah, it's fun coming up with stuff like that. So I suppose with Donkey Kong, you just exaggerate that slightly, like maybe with the eyes. So you watch the, the movement and then when you're animating it, you're, you know, you're adding, I suppose, more exaggerated facial features. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's 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 cartoonier and 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 poppier and stuff than something in uh, in in Metroid uh, like Samus. Uh, Samus would always be kind of very unless she was in like in the middle of an action scene, she would be she would be animated like very subdued. Like you'd always see her kind of like walking into like very you know stoic and heroic, just but like con calmly walking into rooms and stuff. Badass. So unless she was in the middle of shoot, yeah, she was walking into a room like a badass. And uh, so, you know, that was a lot of uh, uh, that wasn't a lot of like exaggerated stuff. But in Donkey Kong was a lot, a lot funner uh, if you like cartoony stuff, because obviously, you know, like, you know, the gorillas are jumping around and running and jumping and you have all these like fun enemies and characters that you could have a lot of uh, a lot of fun with. Mm. Did you get to animate Zero Suit Samus at all? Like any of the end cut scenes where she takes off the helmet and you actually see her face? I animated, let me see. I animated, I can't remember if her helmet was off on this one, but I remember I did animate the, uh, the part. This was one of the big cinematics. It got chopped up into three at the end of, uh, at the end of uh, Metroid Prime 3, where she uh, does like a Maverick flyby by the, uh, by the, by the, I forget what the spaceship's called. Uh, oh, the Olympus. She, as she salutes and gives a thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I did that chunk of that cinematic, I remember. But yeah, her helmet's on there. Uh, there's that's another a cool one. Scene, that, though. It's, it was big. I mean, that's one of the ones that were like big because it like it starts. It's it's not only in the spaceship. It's it's, it's in outer space. It's in Samus's ship. It's back down on the planet with that thing shooting, killing uh, the big... Uh, yeah, that was all. That was all part of that same sequence. Oh, so you animated that entire sequence? I believe so, because it was like I think mine started when there was a, a shot 
that it's kind of like moving around that that cannon that's on the planet that shoots up and then it hits all those radar uh oh, those radar things yes. that reflects it and then blows up uh uh I, I, man for the life of me i forget what that character but that big thing that's moving that's floating through space the uh the olympus or the leviathan is it the leviathan there you go yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that that whole scene where the cannon shoots up, uh, does that, and then Samus does the fly by past the thing and does a salute and the thumbs thumbs up. That whole section was me. That's so cool because all the pretty much all the Samus animations, they're all badass. Like the, all of them. Like was that just the direction? Just like make her look like a badass in every we, single I mean scene. I mean, I'll tell you, we had, we had a great team and, so, you know, half those people are still there. We had a great team of animators and they're all like super passionate and just great people, but they're all super, um, uh, you know, you know, they love games are super passionate about animating. And then, you know, you'd see everybody getting better and better as each game would go on. Um, I mean, again, half those people are there, you know, Steven Zafros is still there, Raphael Billy is still there, Kyle, Dax, I mean, Dax is, Dax and Zafros, uh, Steven Zafros, uh, I went to art school with them, so they were, uh, I think Dax was, they hired seven of us straight out of uh, art school to retro, so he's been there since 2000. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. So Yeah, was that's really much, cool. Was, was, so kind was of unheard much... of. Yeah. But, but was there much pressure? I mean, because when the original Metroid Prime came out, it got it received universal acclaim. I think it had like ninety seven percent or something on Metacritic. And yeah, yeah. And so you you joined the studio. It's like okay, I no mean, pressure. I, w- I wished I worked on the first one, uh, for sure. Uh, I I don't know when I when I went in there, it was almost. I personally went there. I I had been in games. I had two jobs previous. I, wor- I worked at a video uh, uh, cartoon studio making like short cartoon films. And then I worked at high voltage software up in uh, Chicago. That's right. And so that was my first game job. And then uh, I was offered the, the position at retro. So my plan was to, to stay up in Chicago because I like Chicago and I was going to cut my teeth uh, there for a bit. And then within a year, I had the offer to come down to to Nintendo and work for them. So, you know, I, I, I took that job, obviously. And then it was to work on Metroid, which I knew because they had already announced. And uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I think I just went down there just, I, I mean, I couldn't believe that I was going to be able to work on a Metroid, right? And so you're, you're sitting there sometimes like animating like Samus, and it's like I'm animating like... <laughs> I mean, you know, you have those just eureka moments, like how how the hell did I end up here? Uh, so I think when that first day, I don't know if I, I don't remember any pressure. I just remember being super excited at the opportunity to be able to work on that game. So maybe that, you know, I'm sure that's, you know, being naive to a certain point or, or maybe the excitement was, you know, oh, you know, uh, overwrote that. But I, yeah, I, I don't remember feeling uh, stressed and, and, I don't remember the job feeling stressful either because we had our, the, the, the creative director, um, uh, Pacini, our art director, Todd Keller was a, you know, crazy, uh, talented, uh, artist. Um, just the team of engineers that we had back then, uh, was insane. Uh, the animators just, it was, it, it was just a very, ex- it was just super exciting to me and, and everyone was, was doing great stuff. And I just remember it being a, a whole lot of fun. Um, you know, obviously when, you know, you crunch at the end and you're, you're putting in hours to finish the game and there's all that kind of thing. But as far as like, Oh, you know, Oh my God, like this is this big pressure uh, thing. I, I didn't feel that I was just ecstatic that I was, you know, had an opportunity to work on, on Metroid. Hmm. So whenever I'd be curious, I'd be cur- I'd actually be curious to hear uh, what some of my other friends and and uh, coworkers that are still there uh, that were there during that time. I'd be curious to hear what their answers would be to that. Well, Especially yeah. the- <laughs> marked on the first one. Well, I mean, the, the the first one is universally known for a ridiculous amount of crunch for like eight months or whatever it was, some insane yeah. amount of crunch. But apparently, that wasn't the case going forward, which is good. 
No, we had our, our crunch for Metroid 2 was uh, like three and a half months, I think, or four, maybe at the absolute most. And that was just all cinematics and cutscenes, at least for the animators. But was it long hours? Like when, when we talk about crunch, are you meaning like you worked every single day or you just worked long hours? Yeah, I, I personally worked, you know, a good average of like six days a week, sometimes seven. Uh, wow. To get that stuff done. Uh, but I mean, I didn't, I, I mean, again, there was one excitement for it and you're about to push out your first Metroid game. So it was, you know, you were excited to get it done. Uh, but also the way that we, we, at least in my opinion, the way that we did the games back then where it was such a nice steady march all the way to the end. Hmm. That if you have to do all those cutscenes, we weren't still dealing with lots of like, oh, this player needs a whole nother like polish or this character needs a whole nother polish pass. It was just, you can just focus and just like, I have one cinematic every two weeks and you can just, you know, slowly knock that out until, uh, right. Yeah. Until, until they lock you until lockdown. <laughs> is that, is that common in, in the video game industry though, to do cutscenes all at the end? Or was that just a unique yeah. thing that happened on Metro Prime Two and Three? In my experience, in, in the in my experience, the way that it was like we were working on gameplay stuff for the entire uh, the beginning of it, and then the bulk of the cutscenes were all done at the end. I've only experienced that then. Since then, uh, now uh, it's a lot more common to like iterate and block things in, get things in, leave things kind of loose, so a lot of work isn't like lost in, in case like you know other ideas or that you have a change in direction. Uh, so you kind of block in characters and and kind of like leave it loose but yeah you probably don't start doing cut scenes until you, you you're kind of like on your path because otherwise you lose a lot of work every single time something changes or you know the story changes and then all of a sudden you have to redo cut scenes yeah yeah well yeah. I, it would probably be worse if you were doing uh pre-rendered as well as opposed to an engine yeah both i mean i mean both would be a <laughs> <laughs> both would be a product would just be a lot of redone work so <laughs> But that... uh, yeah, the only the only time that I've seen even on Metroid Three, uh, it was kind of the same. But Metroid Three started shifting a little bit, where we were. Um, I remember there was a thing in the in the middle, uh, where there where we already had done some cutscenes, and they kind of changed the story some, and and some of that stuff had to be redone. Oh, really? How how long and in, or far into development did that change? Uh, I, I think it was somewhere in the middle. It wasn't like at the you know very end where it like killed us. I, I don't remember, but I remember one of the cutscenes that was affected was uh, one that I did with Gore. Is uh, when Gore, the the guy that's inside Gore, jumps out, and and I think talks to Samus or something before he jumps back in, and he's like, uh, I think that that one was affected by it and had to redo that one. Uh, but it was as far as I remember, it was somewhere in the middle of production. And then I think that was only the bit, the the only hiccup in regards to that as it related to animation. Then the rest of it was just kind of finishing, finishing the game. But even a small little tweak to the story like that, how much? Oh, time, sure. Yeah. How much? How much time does that actually add to production? Depends how big that tweak is. <laughs> uh, you know how many how many different parts it affects. If it affects just one, you know just one thing that doesn't have a lot of it. It's kind of the same, you know, in terms of I'm not a game designer, but uh, as far as game design and the way that those uh, Metroid games are, are, are put together, it, I would say it's, it's kind of similar to how the, the animation uh, trees are put together, right? The, all the different hubs and everything kind of has to blend into one or the other, right? Right. The game is okay and there's an order and how, um, you know, the, the progression and the narrative has to go through the game and all of a sudden there's a significant story change. Then now you have to maybe reconnect different rooms and, you know, change cinematics and, you know, God knows what else. It just depends on how big of a hiccup it, it is. And it also, I mean, to, to Nintendo's credit, um, they're, they're very good. They're, we, were, we were very fortunate and anyone who still works there, I'm, I'm assuming, is very, very fortunate uh, that they really care about quality. 
they they have no problem if if something's they don't want to push something out the door to push it out the door if something's going out and and they don't think it's to the level of quality they have no no problems in saying nope we're not we're not putting that out the door they're 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 really great at that and for a for creative people it might you know maybe it extends the the dev cycle a bit uh but you know that they're not just going to push something out the door and you're always going to, you're always going to be working on something you can be proud of. Mm. Cause they're, I mean, their games are just consistently, they, they just do fantastic, fantastic stuff. Well, they've, they hardly ever have bugs or game breaking crashes or anything like that. And that's obviously even prior to patches as well, even with patches, they still hardly ever get patches because they're still released in in very good playable condition. Yeah, no, they're 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 great. They uh they have a big testing uh they testing uh studio up in I think it's in Seattle, and uh, so they start hammering on that with a big team like really quick and sending bugs back. So as you're finishing the game, you know you're getting assigned. Everyone's getting split up, you know, getting bu bug split up, and then even once you finish, for instance, like Metroid, when you're done with your cinematics and you have no more tasks then when you run out of tasks, even people inside, you know, all we all start bug testing to help out. So they have tons of eyes on it that are just pounding it all the time. Uh, yeah. They, when they put out a game, it's, it's solid. Hmm. Was there any cutscenes that you animated that never made it in the game? They got a cutscene that got cut. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there were, uh, I just can't, I can't remember any offhand. Uh, but I mean, I'm sure there, there must have been. Okay. Well, obviously, maybe, they, that's, they... maybe that's why they were cut. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, not memorable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say, well, obviously, they couldn't have been that important if you don't even remember the cut scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And it's like you were saying, like in Metroid, there were so many of them. Um, yeah. I mean, I just, I, I, I only remember. Uh, a few, you know, specific ones. But if you if you ask me to name like what's every, you know, what are all the cutscenes that you did? Yeah, I'd be hard pressed. I mean, there was a lot of them, and it was a uh, it was a bit ago. So, and it was a long time ago as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not so getting did, any younger. Yeah. So did the uh, I suppose the camaraderie of the team or the culture of retro change a lot from the early days in Prime Two up until when 2016 when you left or was it still the, relatively the same it was i mean it was still the same uh to me i mean we were working on on uh some unannounced stuff uh but as far as i mean that's the thing with with retro like uh after metroid one a bunch of people left but i mean a lot of the people that i worked with are still there i've been there you know 15 20 years which is, you know, almost unheard of in the game industry just because there's so much turnaround. But it's such a it's it's such a great job working with them is, you know, fantastic. The people that had that studio uh, took real good care of us and are, you know, still, you know, friends, friends with them to this day. And, you know, again, people I went to art school with are, are still at Retro. Uh, I was there for 13 years and, 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 and left, to, you know, just to move to, to New Orleans where I live now. Um, but I'd probably still be there as well. Yeah. If, it must, uh, be, if it I... must be cool for you, obviously, if a lot of the animators and artists are still there, that obviously when Prime 4 comes out, you'll be able to appreciate even more so probably than everyone else what they're capable of or what they can do. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I, yeah, because I mean, the entire, let me see, the entire animation team, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's probably, a few extra people that I never met that were hired after me, but uh, the bulk of the animation team has been there since at least Metroid three. And then the other ones have been there since, uh, yes, yeah, since the first Metroid Daxon and uh, Dax Pilata and, and Steven Zafros uh, were two of the three animators that worked on, on Metroid prime or the four animators. Right. So, so they've been there and they're they're still there. <laughs> well, obviously they must be doing something right. I mean, you stayed there for a long time. So Yeah. Yeah. Was there a particular reason why you left? You were just over Texas or wanted to go somewhere else or just 
Netflix. No, your... I specifically mm. fell in love with New Orleans. And All I'm right. just super, super inspired here. Uh, so since I draw comics and do, you know, art on the side or whatever, I just started coming here. Uh, first time I came was in 2000 and then I didn't come back till 2010, maybe. And then I started coming here like three or four times a year and I just couldn't stop. It just kept as soon as I got back, like I, I wanted to come back. And after a while, it was just I, I just need to move there because I'd like to travel to other places. <laughs> so all I'm doing is going to New Orleans. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just specifically wanted to be here. It's just super inspiring, just the uh, musicians and artists and performers. And if you're a creative person or whatever, I mean, you just walk out the door and you can't help but feel I mean, even the architecture is just, you know, it's just super, super inspiring. So I, I moved specifically to to live here otherwise like i said i, I mean i probably would never have left uh, retro right right yeah that's cool so yeah. i suppose as new orleans become like your your secret power in terms of your uh inspiration and animation ability or drawing ability has it inspired you more yeah i mean it it it's great. I mean, there's a big uh, there's a big community of just artists in general, obviously musicians, but uh, of comic book artists. So there's lots of comic book artists. And this place is like a, a big, small town or a small, big town, however you want to put it. So as soon as you meet two people, like within a week, you'll know like 20. And everybody kind of knows each other. And, and, it, and it's great in, in regards to doing like art shows and things like that. Um, I've run into uh, places or, or situations where there's a, you know, a bit of ter territorialism in regards to, you know, and here every, everyone artists are just, you know, come join our group show, come do this, come to drink and draw, come, everyone is just hyper supportive of each other and, and, and all of the things they're doing. So, yeah, I mean, the people are a big part of what makes this place uh, amazing. That's so, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's so great. You work on comics. So have you got a comic book coming out anytime soon? Yeah, I'm actually kickstarting one in two weeks. Nice. Um, so yeah, go to my website. Yeah. Have you got any uh, have you got any pictures there or anything? You can show me? Uh yeah, I can grab one. Yeah, yeah I'd be keen to see it. Hang, hang on one second. So yeah, this is one. This is the comic that I'm about to kickstart. So I don't know if you can see that. That's a pinup for the end of the book. Ah, oh, that's cool. So yeah, the book is uh, where uh, Microsoft had a studio uptown. There's a comic book store across the street. So I became friends with the owner, and uh, the owner's a bit of a smartass. Uh, so through, uh, oh, here, I'll show you this one too. Uh, so he just in conversation told me one day, he's like, he had kept, he had written down like interesting or funny or crazy interactions he's had with customers. So I'm like, well, let me read them. And then they were just hysterical, just like he is. So I'm like, oh, I'll make a comic of that. So what it is, a bunch of vignettes, like throughout a course of a day of all of these real experiences that he's had with customers here. Which again is a, is a neat kind of like synchronicity kind of thing because then if I never would have moved to New Orleans and met him, then this comic wouldn't exist, right? So another reason. But yeah, this is like the last page of the book when he's leaving. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Yeah. So he's leaving the store. So how long does it take you to do that? Just that one drawing? If, if I have the whole day to do it, uh, anywhere between like 8 and 12 hours. Wow. Okay. If I have like the whole day, like uninterrupted. Do you ever get a sore hand for, from drawing for so long? Not yet. I luckily, well, that's good. I, I, yeah, I've escaped any carpal tunnel or any kind of thing so far. I don't know how, but yeah, not, not yet. Still, still doing well. Oh, well, I'll make the most of it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Until arthritis kicks in or doesn't kick in. Yeah. I'll just switch hands, I guess. <laughs> I'll, Can you I'll draw? Do it in Are you ambidextrous? Can you use both no. hands? Absolutely not. So have you played? Change... What's that? <laughs> I was going to ask, have you played Metroid Dread? You know what? I get asked that and I am dying. I would buy a, uh, I would buy that system just for that game alone. 
uh, the Switch. Hmm. Uh, well, when you when you do get, play it, I'd be interested in your thoughts on the the animation of the cutscenes. Oh, uh, oh, the cutscene. I've seen. I mean, I've seen trailers and stuff on YouTube, and I've seen playthroughs, and everything I've seen animation wise looks incredible in that game. And then I've heard that the game itself is, you know, like oh, it's right. brilliant. Yeah, yeah. But I've seen that that one pre that one robot creature that kind of like flips. Oh like, yes, the ME, yeah. Yep. On the wall and the ceiling and stuff. Oh my god, that thing looks so cool. So, are you able to appreciate that stuff, or do you ever look at it and be like, "Hmm, I could have animated that better," or "I would have done this," or can you just disconnect from it entirely when you're looking at any type of cutscene or animation? Um, no, when you like when you go to like movies and stuff like that, or you you look at stuff, uh, I don't necessarily like look at it to like. I could have done better, but I try to see like what, what they're doing and why that style is like appealing to me. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. For like sure. They're, they're, you know what, you know, why am I going nuts over, you know, this, like the, I mean, this, this is a different kind of thing, but I mean, like when that game cuphead came out. Ah, uh, yes. That blew my mind. The fact that they were able to pull that off in a video game. And then the game is incredible as well uh so different from any kind of game animation or whatever and the fact that they had the you know the the wherewithal to 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 attempt that and do it so well was just amazing the animation on that's incredible yeah i wonder how much time that would have taken to do that yeah that yeah that, yeah, that one that one is one that it's like how not i could do that better that one was like how did they do all that yeah maybe i should get try and get one of the devs on and ask him actually ask him or her i know it's like two i mean 2d animation obviously and they were mimicking that that old style but i think like some of it it was actual like drawn animation well they'd have to wouldn't you yeah there'd be no other way to do it i would think well you could cheat it really how 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 could you cheat it you could i mean like you can make you could get 3d to make it look like stop motion animation and animate it like stop motion. Oh, uh, right. Things like a South Park originally was uh, actual construction paper cutouts, and then yeah. when they actually yeah. went in the thing, they it's all done. It was done in Maya, as far as I understand, to make it look like those same construction paper uh, cutouts. So you could you could mess with things for sure. Mm. So how much is uh, new engines? You know, Unreal Unity. How much time does that save for an animator? these days um for me in particular like i remember uh for uh, everything in donkey kong and, and metroid i guess for that matter uh all the environments and everything that you see uh was hand keyed so like if there was i mean i animated all those to, to the point where we would yeah to the point where we would joke that i was a uh, uh, foliage lead or something like that me and, me and my friends would joke because all the bushes uh like if there was like a rocks in the background that would like kind of crumble and fall like i would rig those and animate that uh so in unreal engine and those kinds of things that you can you know do all that tree swaying and all that kind of stuff yeah that you don't have, you have to worry about that stuff anymore wow but like yeah donkey kong all that stuff uh you know, uh, the wooden bridges where like, you know, Donkey Kong would bounce on the platforms and stuff. Like I would rig and animate a, a bunch of that stuff. I mean, we all, I mean, a lot of us did, but uh, yeah, all that stuff was, was hand animated. Well, I remember specifically in Tropical Freeze, there's so much or so many levels that have, I suppose, destructive terrain. Mm -hmm. So would yeah. you have to go in and keyframe like every single piece as it, I mean, there's some levels that it's like the whole level was just, all collapsing yeah. on itself <laughs> yeah like the, the storm the ocean it was just nuts uh yeah no i mean the the, the terrain I, that i don't remember if that was just that probably i don't think that was rigged and animated but like all the background environment stuff like tree swaying uh like i remember i had to animate um when yeah and i think it's tropical freeze when when it start when they start getting to the area where it starts getting more stormy i had to animate three different levels of the same tree so it was like 
you know, like waving lightly in the thing. And then all of a sudden it's like bent a little bit more because the wind is getting stronger. And then it was like real, you know, so you would have to plug those in into the, into that environment and stuff. All that stuff was hand, hand animated and rigged. Right. Pretty and crazy. I suppose these, yeah, days, now, these days it would be easy, I suppose. Or yeah. Now in a real, yeah. And in exile at Microsoft and stuff, we, we didn't touch any of that stuff. We did mocap stuff and, and, and we, we keyed, you know, the, you know, characters and vehicles and all that stuff, but environment stuff, I never, I never touched, um, you know, trees or anything like that again. <laughs> uh, just cause I mean, yeah, those engines just take care of all that kind of stuff. Hmm. Is there one specific scene that stands out to you where you were kind of like, you finished it and you were kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I nailed that one. Let me think. Uh, I don't know. I was pretty. I was pretty happy with the way that the Al boss turned out overall. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, uh, that that plays well. That's a fun. That's a fun battle to do. And then the the intros and outros and stuff came out pretty good. Uh, there's there's some cinematics in Metroid that I still look at and I, I still like. Yeah, that still looks pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I, I would say just as a yeah, the first thing that comes to my head is that Al boss. Um, encounter that was that was fun and, and still yeah i still remember that fondly it was it was fun to do mm. well those games uh despite a few of them not being in hd they still hold up really well i feel because of the art design and the animation fluidity mm -hmm. yeah they're, i mean it's so well I mean, they're hit of its time they're they're classic games in my opinion. They they have that same kind of deal where it's like you can still go back and play Metroid or or, or uh, Contra or you know old school like classic games. They have that same kind of vibe where like you'll be able to play that game 20 years from now and it'll still be an awesome game. Same same way you look at those old games. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, a good it's kind of like a good song is a good song whether you play it like on acoustic or whether you have a full band. It's kind of the same thing like that, you know, like a good game is a good game. Doesn't matter if it's 8-bit or if it's like all, you know, it's a, a classic game is a classic game. And uh, those games have, you know, totally have that. They're just great platformers. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose with the type of work you do, you wouldn't have been affected that much from the pandemic. Like in terms of doing comics and animating, I mean, because you're, you're so entrenched in a computer and making stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't leave my house for like nine months for the first nine months of it. Uh, so I was just, and we were finishing Wasteland 3 as well for an exile. So we were, we were kind of crunching a bit for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the pandemic is, it, I mean, it was, it was rough. Like being creative was hard during that time for me personally. I know lots of people were just super like prolific. Uh, I wasn't that dude. That's why I'm kickstarting this comic in two weeks as opposed to a year ago. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it was just it was just tough. It was tough uh, to to kind of be inspired without being able to like go to shows and, and see other people like doing creative things and get getting jazzed by things. You're just kind of stuck at home. So for me, it just kind of like um, it kind of killed it for a bit. And then once you were able to start going back out um then it just all started coming back but uh it, yeah it was i mean it was it was tough just being cooped up um like at the beginning it, the first like three months was like oh this is great i get to stay at home all the time and then you just i just started getting diminishing returns where it was just uh but yeah makes sense makes yeah. sense uh final question before i uh let you go sure uh the assets from metroid compared to Donkey Kong. Was there anything at all that was transferred over? The assets? Or assets or even animation tools that were put in place? Uh, assets, no. Animation tools, uh, a bunch carried over and, and were improved uh, as, they, as they were, like, you know, during the course of the game and actually, especially, like, when you're going from one game to the next. Yeah. But Metroid, you know, the Donkey Kong had a different engine uh and then uh and then yeah tools and things were uh were improved like for just an example uh on metroid one when we were doing the the cinematics one week uh one week animation one week scripting 
uh, the scripting of the cameras and stuff had to be done inside the, uh, the proprietary tools that we had. So it was a uh, uh, waypoints and stuff to animate the cameras and stuff. So it was, it was clunkier. And then by the time we got to three, we had, we had the tech to be able to export cameras and do all that stuff straight from Maya. Uh, and so it made doing the cinematics and stuff a lot easier, a lot less, uh, a lot less clunky. Uh, so then every, you know, every, every game, there was like improvements like that. And they would, they would ask us, you know, they'd always uh, put out a, a, you know, what are the, what are the things that artists want to see improved and stuff. And, and they would take, you know, we would say to heart and then they would try to get as, as much of those improvements and upgrades in as possible. Right. So do you think they'd still be using the same engine or do you think they would have migrated to unreal engine four or unity or something? Oh no, they use proprietary stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since I was at Nintendo for so for so long, for thirteen years, and then High Voltage used proprietary stuff back then as well. Uh, Unity and Unreal kind of passed me by. So when I left to an exile, I had to learn Unity and Unreal and Motion Builder and all that stuff, uh, like on the on the job, because <laughs> I've been used to just using proprietary stuff for you know like my entire career. Was that easy to do though, or did it take you a while to kind of I mean, adapt to that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, generally, like things kind of do the same thing. You know, you export it into a game, and there's transitions and blends and things like that. Uh, but it is a new engine, so there's definitely like a learning curve to to get up to speed with that. And then, you know, Unreal's, you know, Unreal's powerful, and you know, the button, you know, the buttons are all in different places, so that's going to take a little bit to figure out uh, where everything is. But yeah, I mean, like anything else, is a learning curve and stuff. But uh, but it wasn't it wasn't too bad. Cool. Well, Carlos, I appreciate you taking time out to do this. Uh, it's much appreciated. Yeah, now, thanks for having me. If, if anyone wants to keep up to date with what you're doing and support your Kickstarter campaign for your awesome comic, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, sure. I have a website. It's uh, www.carlosmendieta.com, just all one word. And then uh, on my Facebook, it's just Carlos Mendieta. Uh, and then I have all that stuff, uh, all the Kickstarter stuff public. So you'll be able to uh, subscribe and and uh, get all the updates and stuff for when it goes live. Mm, cool. So how long does it actually take from the time the comic is actually is put together? How long before it's released usually? Time frame. Uh, I mean, now we're we're having issues with the supply chain stuff, so it's kind of in paper shortage and all that, of course. So that's kind of thrown all that. So I'm, I'm curious about this time uh, what's what the turnaround is. Uh, I've been asking around and it hasn't been too bad, but, you know, people are definitely feeling it. Um, but hopefully it's not too bad because a lot of people, they kickstart stuff and then they do the comic. And then I won't kickstart anything until I have all the pages drawn so I can turn it around and get it into people's hands quicker. Right. Because that's, uh, that's a big mistake people make. They get the Kickstarter, they start it, they do three pages, and then life gets in the way, and then they can't finish the thing. And I try to avoid that as much as possible. Smart man, smart man. Well, Carlos, it's been a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So that is the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. And until next time, stay safe. Bye.